Dini. Yeah. I'm uh, Deborah Rohde, director of the Center on the Legal Profession, which, along with the Women in Politics and American Constitution Society, is sponsoring this event. And needless to say, we're all very grateful to Russ Feingold for making time out of a demanding schedule uh, to add this uh, to these obligations. Russ is the Herman Flager Visiting Professor of Law at Stanford, where he's taught for the last several years. And as I'm sure most of you know, he represented Wisconsin in the United States Senate for 18 years. He served on the Judiciary, Foreign Relations, Budget, and Intelligence Committees, and led bipartisan efforts in campaign finance reform that bear his name. Before that, he served in the Wisconsin State Senate from 1983 to 93, practiced law uh, at a firm in Madison, graduated from the University of Wisconsin, was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and then graduated from Harvard Law School, the only misstep in an otherwise blameless career. <laughs> Since leaving the Senate, he's written a book titled While America Sleeps, A Wake-Up Call to the Post-9-11 World, and served as the United States Special Representative for the African Great Lakes Region and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He's been a visiting professor at Yale and Marquette, as well as here at Stanford. He's going to take the first part of the hour to share some thoughts on the topic and then field questions from all of you. So join me in welcoming Russ Feinberg. Thank you, Professor Rohde, for your uh, leadership, uh, especially your leadership on leadership, which I, I think is... Uh, is sorely in need. We're sorely in need of it now. And thanks to all of you for uh, attending a, at such a busy time. I do know, sort of after having taught at Stanford a few times, that these quarters kind of have a certain momentum at a certain point. So thank you for, for taking the time. The title that was suggested to me uh, for this uh, talk was uh, Making a Difference Through Politics. Now, that to me is kind of upbeat considering what we're going through these days. I had actually suggested a different title entitled Addressing Civic Despair, <laughs> Leadership in Tough Times. So I was kind of worried that the, the title that we decided on is a little bit on, on the smiley face side of things, um, that it's not credible to think of this as just another era where uh, younger people should be encouraged to go into public life. Uh, and I'm, you know, this is a tough time, especially for me, because I am absolutely a glass half full kind of guy, to the point where it drives my family a little bit crazy. But sometimes it's just too much. And I noticed um, on February 20th, I was watching CNN, and this is the day that Jussie Smollett was uh, at least said to have made up uh, this idea that he had been subject to a racist attack. But at the, at the same day, a guy who had been in the Coast Guard was arrested for apparently planning a brutal racist terrorist attack. So they asked David Durbin, who had been you know, advisor to Democrat and Republican presidents, pretty level-headed guy, doesn't show a lot of emotion. What did he say? He just looked at the camera and said, this is despair. This is despair. And I know this is awfully downbeat for a lunch, but if any of you did not see the rabbi's comments, who was almost killed, and a woman was killed trying to save his life yesterday in San Diego, if you did not see his comments, you owe it to yourself to do so. If you are able to watch it twice, you're a better person than I am. I couldn't take it. So what I'm going to try to do is to... <laughs> blend the more positive theme with the more disturbing aspects of what's going on in this country and in this world, and in hopes of persuading you of the value and the challenge of public service, especially now, uh, to repair the breach, to repair the multiple breaches. On a lighter note, I realize that one of my predecessors in the United States Senate was a wonderful guy named Gaylord Nelson. I flew back to Wisconsin last week to pay tribute to him because next year, is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which he invented along with a Stanford student that is sometimes forgotten. But the story about Gaylord was that when he was a young guy, he was taken to see the great Wisconsin icon fighting Bob La Follette. 
And he decided that he wanted to be a senator and be like Bob La Follette. But on the way home, he said to his dad, but I'm worried that, that everything will be taken care of by then. <laughs> Incredibly, I had the same reaction without knowing this. When Gaylord Nelson and Bill Proxmire were our senators, we considered them the best in the country, and I actually said to my dad, if I go into politics, I'm worried everything will be taken care of. This is not a problem that you have to confront. So let me suggest just a few things. First, I want to talk a little bit about what we can all do, whether in public life or not, to acknowledge or even honor acts of civic responsibility. Second, just a little bit about what you should be thinking about if you're thinking of running for public office. Uh, some ideas there, and I would encourage you to think about that. And third, should you end up in public office or working for somebody who's in public office? Or, gee, maybe you'll end up working for one of 25 candidates for president in the next few months. There's some things that I want to at least suggest to you. I know it's tempting to turn off the television and to avoid the constant news syndrome that we face, but somehow we have to stay engaged and aware. I got a huge kick out of a Washington Post article a few months after President Trump was inaugurated. It was in the religion section, and it said, I'm giving up Trump for Lent. Here's how. So I thought that was pretty funny. But uh, anyway, um, the thing is, you can try to avoid what's happening, and sometimes you just have to stand away. But leaders uh, need to know that you are there and that you are evaluating uh, what they are doing uh, to fight the numbness that can set in uh, when institution after institution and belief after belief is attacked. Let's acknowledge and maybe honor uh, those who have drawn the line. Uh, in the spirit of affiliate of uh, even in spite of their own career goals and their lifetime aspirations. Now, one that's easy for me to talk about, of course, is somebody who Professor Rohde had speak here earlier, and that is Sally Yates, Deputy Attorney General. She became the acting Attorney General for a total of 10 days until she was fired by Donald Trump for drawing the line. Right when she was at her career pinnacle, she would not go along with the so-called temporary ban on Muslim-majority countries' refugees. And I had a chance to go up to her afterward and introduce myself, and I said, well, why don't you run for president? She said, no. I said, well, what happens if we get a Democratic president and you are asked to become attorney general? She said, yes. <laughs> so my point is, this was her pinnacle. This was her moment. She was the acting attorney general, and yet she put principle first, and I greatly admire her for this. And of course, brought back memories of one of the most incredible memories, positive memories of my life, which was that night of the Saturday, Saturday Night Massacre, when Archibald Cox, my labor law professor later, and Elliot Richardson said, no, we're not going to play this game for Richard Nixon. And they drew the line, even though uh, this was being part of a Republican administration. Okay, so for me, praising uh, Sally is fairly easy, but I would suggest we have to think about honoring a few other moments uh, that have happened recently, or, or not all of them recently, but to at least give people credit for drawing the line uh, when supposedly they are on the other side. One is a person who's controversial now, but I will never forget, given the fact that I first raised the concerns about uh, George Bush's illegal wiretapping program, that it was John Ashcroft and James Comey who stood up to an attempt to reauthorize that program when John Ashcroft was actually having just a, was in a very intent, pretty intensive care in a hospital, and a Comey went to him and they said no. Uh, that was a very impressive example of drawing the line on the other side. Another one, this is even harder for me, Jeff Sessions. Jeff and I fought about everything. I couldn't believe, frankly, where he was coming from philosophically. There were things that he opposed that seemed to me just strictly out of a desire to make sure that nothing would get done. I mean, even the most tiny aspects of that awful bankruptcy bill, 
he'd get up there and argue anything that we tried to change and make it a little fairer to people that were having hard times. So this is the last guy I thought I'd be up here praising. But the fact is, is that he drew the line. The fact is, he said, I am going to recuse myself. I'm not going to do what Donald Trump tells me to do no matter what, even though he loved that attorney general job. I have no doubt about it. Uh, it might have gotten worse you know, after a while, but this was something that he really wanted to do. Another tough one for me. My late friend John McCain would be shocked to hear me praising Don McGahn. Don was our enemy. Don was the guy who got in the Federal Elections Commission over our objection because he took the view, basically, you shouldn't have any campaign finance laws. So even though it was the law of the land, he went over there and, and drove us crazy, even though we had passed this law. But apparently, and I, I cannot say that I've read the uh, entire Mueller report, apparently he did stand up and refuse uh, to fire Mueller, and that is something that I consider to be uh, drawing the line. An incident that you may or may not have noticed during the testimony of Michael Cohen, when uh, Mark Meadows, Representative Mark Meadows, did this weird thing of having an African-American woman stand up during the middle of the hearing. Well, the chairman, Elijah Cummings, could have joined in on the condemnation and maybe should have, but he said, no, I want to tell you something. I have a good relationship with this man, with Representative Meadows. We work together well. That's not something you expected to hear at that moment. And even though it didn't override all the other things that were going on, to me, it was an example of showing the American people that it is still possible for people across the aisle to have some kind of relationship and to get along. And finally, Robert Mueller himself. I'm very disappointed. But I know Bob Mueller, and I think he's a man of the law. And I think he looked at the evidence and he could not say with any certainty that there had been, quote, collusion. I think if he had thought so, he would have said so. But he, he's a man of the law. He was determined to simply do what it suggested. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think that he thinks that there was obstruction of justice. I think he does. I think he decided to leave it to the political process. But there has to, those of us that are lawyers or want to be lawyers, there has to be some room left for saying, here's a guy who could have been one of the great sort of heroes uh, to many of us forever if he had concluded what he could have concluded. But I think for the right reasons, he said it, it wasn't enough. I do not have these same words for the Attorney General, believe me. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we need those of us who are on the more left side, if we will, and I don't assume that's all of you, but we have to let people know it's not disloyal to sometimes say what, they, what that guy did or that lady did here was actually right and deserves some praise. It's the only way we can pull back from this constant environment of conflict and trying to portray somebody, the other side as always being wrong. Now, having said that, we also have to be able to draw the line the other way. And that is, when somebody crosses the line, we have to call them on it, and something important. I'm hoping that if you're a person who has given credit to those on the other side when they've done the right thing, that that gives you a stronger standing when it's time to say no. And here we have the example of one Mitch McConnell, I, Mitch McConnell was my number one opponent on campaign finance. We called him our Darth Vader. He knew it, too, because he was always there uh, trying to kill our bill. But, you know, it was a fair fight over many years. He ran to the Supreme Court, making it McConnell versus FEC in the hope that forever it would be a Supreme Court precedent where his name was first. Well, it's a Supreme Court precedent, all right. But he lost. But that was sort of fair play. It was just out there. He was opposed to the legislation. One other thing about Mitch McConnell. I will always be grateful to him, and those of you that have been in my classes that are in the room know what I'm going to say. You know, he was one of three Republican senators to stand up when 16 Democratic senators wouldn't stand up 
to vote against the flag burning amendment. One vote. As McConnell said, it was a First Amendment issue. So I didn't have exclusively negative feelings about it, mostly, but they weren't personal. Where I think he crossed the line was the outrageous theft of the United States Supreme Court. The idea that somehow President Obama, elected overwhelmingly by the American people, didn't get to fill Justice Scalia's seat. In my long career of some 35, 40 years, is one of the worst acts against our Constitution in the Senate uh, that I've ever seen. Recent article by um, Robert Reich said, step by step, McConnell has sacrificed the Senate as an institution to partisan political victories. There's a de vast difference between winning at politics by playing according to the norms out of democracy and winning by subverting those norms. In my view, uh, this has to be called out. It cannot be forgotten. It has to be corrected. It has to be a seat filled, a, a conservative seat, filled by somebody that a majority of Democrats in the United States Senate would actually support. And I think it should be a mantra in the campaign. I'll tell you one thing the conservatives are very good about. They pick some, an incident or something that's happened, and they keep reminding people about it. We, and I'm speaking here just for some of us, we as Democrats tend to move on and say, well, what can we do about it? In a few minutes, I'll say something we can do about it. But this is an example where you don't forgive. This is an example where you say there has to be reparation in effect. So let's say you want to be more involved in an engaged citizen and that you actually want to run for office. Some of you have come to me and, and talked to me about this. Now, this doesn't work for everybody. If you were born uh, in Manhattan, you know, it's not so easy to tell you, go back home. Maybe you can go back home, but you know, that's a tough political market to break into. Uh, but you might. But I think what I want people to think about, and I think one of the problems has become, is a lot of us don't return to our home communities. And I understand that. Look, the allure of, of places like San Francisco and Chicago and New York and D.C., it's, it's strong, frankly, stronger than it was when I was, when I was your age. But the point here is, you know, hopefully you are not seeking public office or power for power's sake. Hopefully you are interested in the people with whom you grew up. And what I would suggest is you go back home after you finish law school or after you do a few other things, because you want to live there. Let's say you want to raise your family there. I'll tell you why. Because you're probably going to lose, OK? The, the, I, I lucked out. The odds are, if you're planning a political career, all that planning probably won't work out. And I also know something else. You don't get to stay in the job forever, probably. So you should go where you want to be and where you think life would be good if you never uh, entered public office. And I think uh, part of our problem has become is that uh, it is felt by many in those smaller and middle-sized towns around the country that those who do well in school and go to the top universities uh, no longer come back and show an interest in those hometowns. And uh, I think sometimes it leads to a feeling of there being two different uh, groups of people that uh, really have nothing in common. Somehow we have to change that. And if you are able, um, believe me, it is a very rewarding life to combine a day-to-day -day contact with people who work hard and make their communities work, and then being able to go and represent them, whether it's in the state capitol or the US capitol. It is a dynamic and exciting experience. So let's say you're in office or you've landed a job with somebody who's in public office. Let me just suggest a few things that you might want to do. First of all, I would strongly suggest that before you start all this, you know what you'd lose your job for, what you'd simply give up the job for, something you believe in. Uh, you know, I tried, you got to keep this to a limited amount. I certainly did not plan on losing my career on, on being right or wrong about a particular issue uh, special to the dairy industry. 
Because Wisconsinites knew a lot more about it than I did, and I learned from them. You know, most stuff people are telling you about, and you should follow what they say. But there are hopefully some core beliefs, some moments where you would say, no, I'm not doing this. A good example was former United States Senator Charles Robb, a military veteran from Virginia who had the courage to vote against the flag-burning amendment at a time when Virginia was a much different place, particularly vis-a-vis -vis this kind of issue. I think in part he lost his seat because of that. For me, it was always my complete moral opposition to the death penalty in any form and my opposition to what our last president called dumb wars. That was fundamental to me. I'm afraid there's a counterexample, somebody I used to get along with pretty well. I think he's a pretty funny guy, but I don't think it's funny what he's been doing, and that's Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham was one of our first co-sponsors of McCain-Feingold when he was in the House. Whenever John McCain would take a progressive stand, Lindsey was right with him. They were best buddies, and they were inseparable. I remember when I was under attack in 2010 from the Tea Party and my town meetings turned into these debacles of people screaming at me, uh, I said something about climate change. And I said, well... Lindsey Graham is co-sponsoring a bill with John Kerry on climate change. Oh, he's a rhino, a Republican in name only. And he was censured by the South Carolina Republican Party for his consorting with Democrats. And so I do not understand what this guy is doing right now. By going along with every absurd proposition that this president puts forward, I, don't, I, I do know why he's doing it because he's afraid of losing a primary for the United States Senate. In other words, he doesn't know what it is that he would give up his seat for. It's just having the seat, being called a senator. I'll tell you something, it's great to be called a senator for about six months. You know, it wears off pretty fast. It's not something to base your life on. And yet you see this craven behavior vis-a-vis -vis a president who is acting outlandishly. On the other hand, one should try to do bipartisan work whenever possible. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean, in my view, what a lot of people think is, we need moderates, we need to meet in the middle on everything. I've seen politicians in both the Wisconsin State Senate and the United States Senate meeting in the middle as they trade pork projects to grease the wheels for a lousy piece of legislation. You know, compromise, meeting in the middle, being a moderate, that is not by itself what I consider bipartisanship. I think you can be a strong ideologue on the left and a strong ideologue on the right and come to the same conclusion. This is what's happened with prison reform, perhaps for different reasons. But these are not sort of moderate, very cautious people. They are people who see something outrageous who have come together. So I think it's important to do that, and yes, frankly, because you do have to at least consider this, it's good politics, usually. Maybe not for Lindsey Graham, but I think in a lot of places it still has some resonance. I'll never forget when I did a town meeting in every one of Wisconsin counties uh, every year, 72 listening sessions a year. One time we went up to a great county, very Republican county called Wapaka County. Beautiful place, but it, the crowd was pretty conservative, and I came in and I just started off, as I always did for a minute, and I said, you know, I'm going to be doing a bill with John McCain. And they all just started cheering. I said, we don't even know what the bill is. I said, it could be against the dairy industry, of all things. Um, but I, I still believe that there is this fundamental desire that will come back to do what people told me when I first ran for the state senate. I knocked on 15,000 doors and managed to pull out a 31-vote victory. But early on in my knocking on doors in some of these rural towns, I would start talking about Democrat, Republican, and, and they go, we don't want to hear any of that. We want to know what your ideas are. And I never forgot that. I still think people in the long run, maybe it's naive, believe that. And I want to pay tribute to somebody that's had a rough couple of years, Hillary Clinton. When she came to the Senate, she truly did reach out to just about every single Republican and do a bipartisan bill. 
Well, maybe you could say she was doing that for political reasons, but really that doesn't translate into a presidential race. But almost every Republican said that she was diligent and tried to make that happen. A third thing to do if you end up in one of these jobs is to reassert the prerogatives of the institution that you're in, whether it's the Senate or the House of Representatives or the state legislature. Those in my classes know I talk a lot about the failure of the Senate and the House to assert itself with regard to the war powers that are delegated to it in the Constitution. I've been railing away about the failure to insist that if a treaty is terminated, that it can't just be done by the President, but I believe it should have to be approved by the Senate and the House, perhaps, to demand the access to intelligence that the Congress is entitled to and that this President and, frankly, other Presidents have frequently denied to the intelligence, uh, to the, those people on the intelligence committees. Obviously, the recent failure, well, it was successful in terms of the votes in the House and the Senate on the so-called emergency powers, but the failure to override the President's veto. Uh, somehow to make sure that, that the Congress is speaking on this, on these issues, so that if the Supreme Court happens to decide that in its infinite wisdom it can take a notice of it and act on it despite the political question doctrine, that there's something there uh, for the court to say, actually, the Congress has a different view on this. And it reminds me of something that has been apparently in my family for something like 100 years, which is this sort of bromide or palliative, if you will, which is when things go bad, my, my aunt, who's now like 98 years old, she, she said, you know what your dad used to say? He always said, things are cyclical. Things will turn around. And I, I listened to that, and I thought, yeah, that's helpful. And I thought, yeah, what happens when you're in power? Things are cyclical. <laughs> Things are going to get bad again, if that's really true. And so I think a lot of us fell for this when uh, what was essentially a miracle when President Obama was elected president. I think we really thought that something fundamental had changed in the American spirit and the American character allowing this moment to occur. But somehow um, a vicious counter-reaction occurred. And uh, for me, um, this is where the danger is of not asserting that institutional power. Oh, President Obama's president, Bill Clinton's president, so what if the president has all this power? Those guys in the Congress, they don't know what they're doing anyway. I was on a panel at Yale last year about war powers, where I was on the panel with two uh, former lawyers, one for Bush and one for Obama, who said what they had to do to figure out whether the authorization for the use of military force covered certain other groups like ISIS and others. Their attitude toward the congressional opinions on this was that it was a, a joke and that it was all about the executive and the office of legal counsel and maybe if for some time the court got involved. Well, I think that we're, we're reaping the whirlwind right now. We have a president who is willing to take those powers that we weren't always careful to curtail or cabin, and he's going to town with it. So I think it's very important that we stand up for the institution. And just to allude again to what you have to do sometimes when something truly wrong has been done. And here I want to get back to the, the, the Merrick Garland theft. You might say, well, if Democrats... Uh, do this, it's just going to keep happening, and what we'll end up with is just a completely destroyed United States Supreme Court. Well, there are ways you can handle this. And what I would suggest is that the candidates for president get out there and say, we will get that seat back. That seat. So what you can do is campaign on it, win the majority in the Senate, hopefully, which is a chance, and say, for the next conservative opening, we're going to keep the 51 vote rule. Once that is done, we're going to offer, by unanimous consent, that we return to the filibuster rule, at least for all Supreme Court justices, probably all Court of Appeals justices, and perhaps for the district judges. Make that offer. Make it public campaign on. The one thing you got to give Donald Trump credit for is he campaigned on stuff, he said I'm going to do this, and I couldn't believe half the stuff he was saying, but a lot of people give him credit for that. 
instead of being wishy-washy, let's say, we will get justice on this, we, we will get a justice on this, and then we will move forward. Then we will try to come back and see if that can work. But I believe that there is no compromise uh, in terms of not uh, redressing this wrong. Last thing I want to mention, which um, one of my teaching assistants here suggested that I talk about, is what about the people that, that work for, for you or for a congressman, for a senator? Who should you hire? Who should be there? Well, one of the crazy things I did when I was running for the Senate, because I actually put my pledges on our garage door for a year on the House, and one of my pledges uh, that I added was because I was trying to make it very clear I was going to be a Wisconsin senator. I said that a, I would always have a majority of my staff members be from Wisconsin. And I did do that. Of course, a lot of ones back in Wisconsin counted, and it, most of them were from Wisconsin. But the thing I want to say is somehow you have to blend your responsibility to make sure the people who work for you understand the people you have elected you. But you also have to try to get uh, very, very good people to handle some of the delicate stuff, such as the work I was doing on foreign relations, the Intelligence Committee and Judiciary Committee. If you're a senator, after you've been there a little while, you, get a, you can choose just about it. The applications are incredible, wonderful people uh, that you can hire. And what I always thought was, what's the purpose here? What am I trying to do? Well, yes, you want to make sure that this, the campaign finance bill is done right and that it passes constitutional muster, and you need people that can produce the record that we have that was very important in that case. And, and that's all about being very wrapped up in your own goals and your own work. But that's not all you're there for. You are also there to train future leaders, because they're going to be in the position I was in someday, and they need to have the skills, including those back in your home state, so they can do it as well. So somehow you have to balance the moment and what you're trying to do with the need to train people. And when you have that mix, there's this wonderful um, uh, relationship that develops where some of the people that are sort of experts work with the, the people that have come perhaps from the home state, and they really learn from each other. And they really create an esprit de corps that works very, very well. So I think that's something to keep in mind when you're in a position, whether you're a DOJ or wherever you might be, to have a mix like that looking forward uh, to the future as well as to what you're trying to do right now. So let me conclude by saying uh, uh, the reason I wanted to talk a little about civic despair is, is because uh, what we need to do is appeal to and protect the values of this nation and our system of government over what appears to be a, a, a continuous politics of, of anger and division. I guess I fundamentally still believe that this kind of anger can't be sustained permanently, that people will get sick of it and will reject it. I obviously hope that happens earlier rather than later. I like what Van Jones said the other day when Biden announced, and I'm not endorsing Biden at this point. I don't know if I will. Van Jones says he wasn't endorsing Biden, but he did say this. Joe Biden is calling us up. I like that. He's talking about our higher values, and that's something people need to hear. And we have to somehow be realistic about that beautiful phrase that is so often uh, quoted from Martin Luther King, uh, who was uh, paraphrasing another from a previous time, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That's meant to be reassuring, and, but it should not be a palliative or a guarantee. I, I have a feeling in the midst of this civic despair and the rise of authoritarianism around the world, I'm not so sure it's bending in the right direction. I'm less confident of it than I was, have been at any point in my life. And I hate saying that. It kind of means it's time for you guys to take over. In these times, we have to actually make it so. And so let me finish by quoting a sort of conservative columnist, uh, David Brooks who essentially paraphrased the beautiful words of Robert Kennedy in Cape Town in the mid-1960s when he was in apartheid South Africa. Bobby Kennedy said something very similar, but I like the way that Brooks said it. 
We're living in a moment when norms are in maximum flux. Donald Trump has smashed through hundreds of our established norms and given people permission to say things that were unsayable just a decade ago. Especially in politics, the old rules of decorous behavior no longer apply. But we all have the power to create cultural microclimates around us through the way we act and communicate. When a small group of people shift the way they show approval and disapproval, it can shift the social cures among wider and wider circles. Suddenly, revolutions. The whole school of fish has shifted course in rapid ways that would have astounded us beforehand. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Professor? Well, I'll, I'll start. It's, maybe it's the elephant in the room. Um, do you think it's healthy for, um, for the left to have the array of candidates and any of whom don't have a plausible chance but seem to be doing some resume building and in the process may be doing a little uh, mutual self-destruction, or do you think that's a, having that many people is a healthy uh, uh, phenomenon? Do you have a favorite? And can you ah, you slipped that in very smoothly. Yeah. Uh, um, a word about Biden and his apologies? Sure. Um, that was a bunch of questions. Um, <laughs> the first is, you know, politics is in part entertainment, and I think having all those candidates has a bit of an entertainment value. Not many of them are going to be along that, around that long. So I, I'm not really worried that all these folks are going to be kicking around that long. Because even though uh, they may be positioning some, themselves for the future, um, I think you know, it's expensive to run around the country in a credible way. So I mean, I like the fact that it's a mix of sort of longtime political people, uh, senators, we have five or six women running. We have. Um, several governors. We have uh, people that are very uh, strong on the left. We even have a mayor from, Indi uh, from uh, okay. South Bend who I hear good things about from every kind of person I've ever met. Um, I mean, Me I, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, so this is good. I and mean, what people are saying, oh, here's a mayor. Here's a governor. Here's a senator. Here's, here's a guy that's been vice president. Here's a guy that, that, that uh, took on Hillary Clinton and, and has a huge army of young people supporting him. I think it, it makes the party look good, and I think it makes people feel good about the country in the long run. So I think it's good. Um, I am leaning towards sort of the younger candidates. I, I, I don't, there's nobody in particular uh, that I've decided I'm, I'm going to support. I'm, I'm toying with it. But I, I do think it's, there's a generational opportunity. I do think Biden would probably beat uh, Trump, and I'd be very happy about that. But you know, I'm sort of looking at it the way that Mayor Pete was talking about it, as sort of about the opportunity to, about the era could have an excitement level to it um, that would um, be reminiscent of some of the excitement we felt about Barack Obama. And I do not understand why my friend Joe Biden couldn't just say the words, I apologize. It's as simple as that. I mean, don't have to talk about how mores have changed and all of this. Just, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be doing it anymore. I think that was all of those questions. All of those questions. <laughs> yes, Kelsey. I, I think there's a problem with a lot of Democrats not being able to just talk like they're talking to a real person and to put themselves in the shoes of, of, of a, it's sort of a using, using uh, pieces of legislation or using sort of wonky stuff. Um, and by the way, an exception to this is somebody who is said to be the wonkiest of the group. It's Elizabeth Warren. She knows how to talk about people because she's the real deal. I should have mentioned her. <laughs> She is a person who came up all by herself 
and her ability to talk about how she was a single mom and had to pay 50 bucks to go, to, I think, to community college in Houston and managed to go to law school and ended up teaching at Harvard Law School and now United States Center for Massachusetts. That is an authentic story. Uh, even though, and they know that. That's why the, this whole Pocahontas thing is done. It's all about making an authentic person inauthentic. You may not like her. You may not like the way she talks. You may think that she's too smart. But she is authentic. And I think we need uh, candidates who are able to do that. And yes, it does involve repeat. And one thing you, you learn as a, both in campaigns and as a, uh, when you're trying to pass something is you have to repeat the same thing so many times you want to cry. You feel so stupid. Why did I go to school for 25 years just to say over and over again, you know, the United States Senate is not is the is the United States Senate. It's not the House of Lords. You know, I might have said that 500 million times. Uh, but you know, if you're if you're not willing to do that, of course, it's easier these days because of the social media and so on. But yeah, the, we are not as good at that. And um, you know, it's a, that horrible thing about seeing nuances in things and wanting to explain them. I remember once we had this huge, beautiful rally. They even used it for um, television ads for John Kerry. It was held in this gorgeous place in western Wisconsin on a big farm with huge silos. And it, the clip was great, but I remember he got up there and, and started talking. And he's a really smart guy. He, he was my boss at the State Department. And he started listing four or five pieces of legislation. You know, just like, okay, then we had to build it to this, and we had to build it. Oh, God. It killed the rally. You know, there, are, there are ways to talk about these things in a different way. I, I guess, I, yeah, so far they seem to be better at it. But that may turn around. Some of the candidates this time are pretty good. So thank you for all your tireless efforts over the years on campaign finance reform. Yet today we're in a place where most people in the world, in the U.S., political system is one that's highly driven by money. And when a new candidate announces for the presidency, the first metric people look at is how much money did he or she raise in the first 70 what would it take to get people to fundamentally rethink how we're running the system and the, the pervasive influence of, of big money? Well, that's, of course, what John McCain and I devoted eight years to doing. And, you know, sadly, the first person to refuse to take the presidential limits for the public funding was Barack Obama. I mean, people, presidential campaigns were not about who had the most money when I was growing up, because we had that system. It was equal. Now, there are problems with how you could enforce it now and how it would work, but in my fantasy sort of world, we would get back to that. This didn't used to be the way it was. <laughs> I don't remember at any point people saying, oh, Bob Dole raised $3 million in the first three days. You know, this was, wasn't part of it. Now, there is one part of it that is good, though, and I think it's the reason Citizens United was engineered to stop our momentum. We had passed McCain-Feingold, which banned soft money to the parties, which it still does. But they realized that there was something going on, and that was the power of electronic democracy. Howard Dean, Barack Obama, and others, and frankly, I benefited from this tremendously, that if you could build a list of people who would give 10 15 $25, or 100 bucks, this was incredibly powerful. There was no quid pro quo. I wasn't calling up everybody that gave 50 bucks and saying, can you give another 50 bucks? It was just, will you help us? And it caused the average person who might have an extra $10, a student or a 90-year-old person, to get involved. I think this is the reason they engineered this thing and ridiculously ignored the, the 1907 Tillman Act, which said that corporations should not be able to contribute to campaigns. So I think we had it uh, in the right spot. We had succeeded until Citizens United. And if we could somehow put that genie back in the bottle, we could make it work again. Uh, of course, that will mean my previous discussion about getting certain Supreme Court seats back would have to happen. Um, so um, at a, in the meantime, legislatively requiring disclosure, which is even the Citizens United Court, the majority of Justice Kennedy said, well, we assume that there will be disclosure. And then uh, calling it for what it is, that, that the whole thing's premised on the idea that there's not a coordination uh, between the corporation and the super PAC, when in fact, uh, that's exactly what goes on, and there's no penalty, 
and the Congress could put serious uh, felony penalties into that. So those are some things that could be done, but it's, it's a very disappointing time in this regard. And yes, the rest of the world is just looking at this and scratching their head. And now, our wonderful super PAC people, I just got a, I did an interview for, for the UK, uh, Bannon is, and others are creating super PACs for all the far right groups in Europe. So they're infecting that process. Um, and I'm sure they'll do it elsewhere as well. I would endorse him for the Republican nomination. <laughs> <laughs> and he wouldn't want my endorsement. <laughs> Have you asked him? No, I, 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 I haven't. You said he's here, right? He's here. He's at the Hoover Institute. He's over there with uh, the former Secretary of Defense, right? Yeah. Mad dog. They're, they're on campus. They're, they're away from Trump. Yeah, and this may be naive on my part. Um, I'm sure it is harder than it was. I will say this, though, and maybe it's just in Wisconsin. When I ran in 2016, we had a blast. We went to, went to all the counties. I, I found these wonderful things going on in some of these towns. There's a town called Viroqua, Wisconsin, which is near the Mississippi River. A bunch of young couples have moved there, and they've got this great coffee shop and this Wisconsin soda pop thing going, and, and it's got great music and organic farms. And, all and this is a traditionally conservative area. And what's happened, although you might, I don't want to bore you with uh, sort of Wisconsin uh, political uh, geography, for some reason, the southwestern part of the state of Wisconsin has become more progressive when the rest of the state has changed. One of the weirdest things is that I carried five counties that Trump carried. Uh, but a lot of people are sort of more to the left in that area, as, you know, sadly, a lot of the older farmers and others are no longer to keep their farms. There are areas where this kind of, um, where, where uh, younger people, maybe some of you are like this, they actually want to go because of the quality of life to live in a place like this because you can do all kinds of stuff now that you couldn't do there in the past because of the Internet primarily. You can have a really fascinating work. You can practice law, you can do a lot of things. So I do understand what you're saying about your actual town and the people you knew. But and it, of course, it doesn't have to be rural. Obviously, it could be urban. It can be places where uh, people uh, return or go to a neighborhood where they feel they can relate to people and um, would not, you know, the worst thing you can say, <laughs> I forgot to say this, is I'm coming back to run for office. It's not attractive, OK? <laughs> it's like, I'm back. You need me. Don't say that. Think it if you want, but don't say it. You, you had a question. Um, you think that social media and technology are improving the electoral process and even government for the better? Well, the last time I was here in 2017, I did a policy lab on, I was asked to do a policy lab on fake news and, and misinformation. And I was one of the first people to sort of have the benefit of five really smart CS students and five really smart law students. And it was horrific what we saw. Um, but my overall view is that in the long run, the ability to access this information domestically as well as internationally, learning the skills of being able to figure out what's true and what isn't, that that is ultimately going to be an advantage uh, for a progressive society. And um, you know, maybe it's just that I, I'm too taken with the thrill of being able to get any information I need or contact anybody I need instantaneously. It, it's phenomenal. It's a way to connect with people. 
Uh, I mean, just maintaining your relationships. You know, talk about how your friends no longer live in, in your town in Kansas and so on. You know, this is a way where you can maintain contact with people relatively easily throughout your life in a way that, you know, unless you're a really good letter writer, or you really make that your emphasis. So I, I think it allows people to network in a positive way. And in the long run, if we can figure out how to handle this without uh, foolishly trying to regulate content, and this may be more of an antitrust area, um, I think it, it still has great promise for the future. But it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous and difficult uh, thing. Hope. I sort of been thinking because I feel like on the left we have a problem with Brandenburg, where it's like the right side is really really integrated. But even as we saw in the midterm elections, Brandenburg was like an enormous catalyst. Like it's it true. Well, of course, the left did harness it effectively at an appropriate time in 2018. I'm not saying it never has its place. What I'm saying is continuous anger without any sort of statement by people, it's time for us to kind of get along if we can. I think that doesn't work in the long run, and you don't look very appealing politically. But, you know, so I'm thinking, I think a 2020 candidate for us should be somebody who conveys a sense of calm, somebody who conveys a sense of uh, cooperation. And I, I do think people are psychologically exhausted from, I mean, maybe not younger people, maybe because you know, you, you're young and you've been, you haven't been through all this forever. But for an awful lot of the people that vote uh, very consistently, I think they're just worn out. And they, they're willing to vote for somebody who is capable, but is going to tamp down the, the anger. Well, maybe they'll get sick of that after a while. But I think that's probably going to be the next phase. Uh, I mean, anger is really exciting when everybody's, you know, sort of, you, you know what the criticism of the political parties in the United States used to be. What do they always say? Exactly. You got it. I, like the way I thought you smiled. He knows what I'm going to say. What's the difference? It's Tweedledee. It's Tweedledum. They don't say that anymore. I mean, this was the fundamental thing about American politics that it didn't matter to Monta Hill of Beans, the difference between the parties. So I think you uh, have real differences now, and that's a good thing. But I think people are going to want um, a sense that somebody's going to try to govern and solve the problems. Uh, and it's kind of gotten the, you know, when you have the Tweedledee and Tweedledum and somebody just comes out and starts screaming, that's kind of fun. What was the movie about TV? Um, I'm sick and tired. And what's it? Network. And what was the line? I'm not going to take it anymore. Well, you know, that always has a certain appeal. But when everybody's running around saying, I'm not going to take it anymore, it gets kind of old. That, I, this may not make sense to you, but I believe it is part of the key to what's going to happen in the election. I do think it's going to come back. I think it's starting to come back already. Um, first thing to be aware of is that when I first went to the United States Senate in 1993-94, it wasn't particularly partisan at all. It really started to change with the contract with America and Newt Gingrich, and then the Democrats decided to sort of play the same kind of games, and then you had the rise of Fox News and, and others and the 
uh, people finding their own uh, you know, tunnel vision opportunity to just look in their own uh, at the things they want to hear. This is all relatively recent, and it led to this, to this kind of attitude. So, and, and what I mentioned before, politicians being terrified, particularly Republicans, of losing their position from the right, as occurred in uh, Utah and Indiana. My friend Dick Luger just died uh, two days ago, Richard Luger, great moderate Republican senator. He was thrown out by the right wingers. So all that is a problem. But as uh, you probably are aware, there was a great land and water conservation pro program with many designations of natural lands passed uh, by a strong bipartisan vote signed by President Trump. The prison reform bill, some of the professors here have told me it's not that good, but it was passed on a bipartisan basis. There is a far greater amount of activism of resolutions challenging uh, military interventions than there was even a year ago or two years ago. So I think there's a market for this, and I think uh, members of the Senate and the House are realizing that their own political futures may depend on actually showing that they are going to do this. But it's, it's too early to tell. But I do think it's beginning to change. Anything else? Going once. Ah, yes. Yeah, well, you know, it'll, a lot of it will be determined by the presidential election, in particular what happens in the Democratic primary. Uh, if somebody who's considered more moderate wins, uh, and I'm not necessarily advocating that. I tend to be more on the left side, but if that happens, it may open the door to a president who people will see as opening the door to a more moderate approach. I, I substantively I tend to agree with the more left candidates on almost all the, the issues. Um, you know, I was sort of intrigued uh, by the back and forth the other day about uh, this issue about whether prisoners should be able to vote. I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. Why not? Was it part of their sentence? Uh, do, are they not interested in the political process? <laughs> yes, they are. They're living in a, in a cage. But yet there's already a disagreement. Mayor Pete said no. Bernie said yes. You know, so I'm very attracted to the substantive opportunity to take a more progressive stand and see if you can do it, but I think there's a better than even chance we'll probably end up with a more moderate presidential candidate. And I'm guessing that if that person wins, that may open the door to what you described. It will not happen with, if Donald Trump is reelected. There I said it. Don't want to say that. Yes. Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. <laughs> Wonder why I remember that. Well, look, I, I think this is a different situation. I agree with you with what happened there. Um, 
I don't think people Trump, Trump, th thought Trump could win. And I think they were screwing around. I think some Republicans who were definitely going to vote for Hillary at the last minute thought, she's going to win. I'm just going to send her a message. I've seen this happen in Wisconsin gubernatorial races. I don't think that's going to happen this time. Okay. I, I'm not saying there aren't some. <laughs> Here's one thing you can take to the bank. I've been wrong about all my predictions for the last 10 years. So, you know, you can always just flip it on the other side. I used to be pretty good. Um, but I do think now we know what happens if you goof around like that. Um, at least in Wisconsin, I think we're going to be OK. But we'll see. One more? Oh, I can do two. Yes, the two of you. Yes. The, the expansion of presidential power? So, um, yeah, what we consider, like, given the, the expansion of American politics, the expansion of American politics is more dangerous. Yes. Yeah. So do you think those norms, what we consider to be social norms, should be yes. codified? But not Much more so. And there's different ways to do that. Yeah. Uh, one way that we talk about in my Senate course is through the use of the Senate rules by, for example, requiring when there is a military intervention, that there be a vote and a debate at a time certain and an actual vote, rather than just letting slough off. Uh, so that is something that can be done by the Senate or House rules. Uh, you can do some of this through legislation. But in some cases, and this is a little tip of my hat to my students in my Amending the Constitution course who are here today, you might need some constitutional amendments. One of the professors here uh, suggested to me that we should work together on a constitutional amendment to limit the pardon power. I mean, at least so the president can't pardon himself. Okay? <laughs> we, we at least agree on that. You know, something that was a norm, you know, that really didn't worry much about presidents pardoning themselves. But this guy, I can do that. You know, so, so uh, you know, I, I, I'm one who's concerned about too much amending the Constitution, but this is one of those moments where somehow we have to, as you say, codify in different ways certain things that protect the norms. I think that would be good. Last question. Uh, are any of you having like, takeaway advice for us um, beyond the ability to vote That's right. Um, so yeah, just beyond, you know, beyond those things, do you have advice for us? Yeah, this may not be responsive, but it, it's something that surprised me as I got went through life and years I've had and different things I've got to do. You don't need to decide to do any of this stuff now. I mean, if you have good health and you live a nice long life, you're likely going to have three or four different careers. And you know that's not the way it was when I was growing up. You were a politician or you were a journalist, or you were a doctor, or whatever you were, a worker. And it, there really wasn't a thought that you would do this for a while, then that for a while. So in some ways, it's bad. Because we've had, for example, the breaking down of the line between journalism and politics. And uh, so it's been damaging to some of the professions. But there's also a flexibility there. So you can say, well, I'd love to run for office, but it costs too much money, and then 20 years from now, you might choose to do it. In other words, don't look at it as you've gone, you know, door number one or door number two. It may not play out that way, and it doesn't have to. And so you can be sort of more relaxed about it. Um, so I, that, that would be my advice. Um, uh, I did, you know, I'm sort of known as a guy that knows a lot about Africa now. I don't think I know as much as people think. But I didn't know a darn thing until I was 40, nothing, until I ended up on the subcommittee on Africa. And it's become this huge part of my life. It's so thrilling and interesting for 25 years. There's just, the, the, you, you can start something completely, you can end up being president starting at 40 without having to run for any office. Oh, we've got a guy that did that uh, in office right now. So th that's all I'd say. It's, it's, it's something that, I know this is a, a tough environment, a wonderful place to be, but a tough competitive environment. And, and you know, you gotta make a living and you gotta have a family if you want to, and so, so et cetera. Um, there's time to kind of 
try out different things, especially if you're somebody who got, went through Stanford Law School. You created a good foundation. Thanks.